Let's look at this nice geometric counting problem that I found in the math magazine. So let's suppose that we've got a triangle broken up into sub triangles in the following manner. So I guess we could start at the base here and we'll break the base up into n segments. And so notice here we've got a point here. So here's a subsegment, here's another one, and then we end with these two. So in total, there are n subsegments. And from those subsegments, you build these equilateral triangles, kind of facing up and facing down. And then you do that all the way up until you reach the top. And I guess a real classic question here would be how many total triangles are there in this picture? But in this case, the question is how many parallelograms are in this picture. And I think maybe to get started, let's look at a very small example. And that small example will be what happens if we break up this base into two pieces. And so that means that we've got just this kind of picture right here. And so let's get a couple of those on the board so that we can draw on them and count the number of parallelograms we find. And you know, we're not gonna have perfect parallelograms here because I'm just drawing it by hand, but you can imagine what it would be if we got out like a ruler and a compass. Okay, so we've got this kind of picture right here. And now, well, let's draw some parallelograms. So in this picture, here's a parallelogram here, kind of in the bottom left corner. And then notice there's a companion over here in the bottom right corner. But notice there's nothing special about the bottom left and the bottom right corner. So we could have one in the so-called top corner as well. So that would be something like this. And now if we look at this, we really want a way to maybe count these carefully. So what is really defining these parallelograms? Well, they can be defined by their vertices. So let's look at opposite sides vertices or opposite pairs of vertices. So if we look at the two vertices here, there's really nothing special about them. Notice they're connected by a line segment. But if we look at the vertices attached to the acute angles, they are not connected by a line segment. So there, observe there's no line segment from this vertex down here to this vertex up here. And well, we have the same fact in this second parallelogram as well, and this third parallelogram as well. And in fact, those are all of the pairs of vertices that are not connected. So it turns out it looks like if you take a pair of vertices that are not connected via a line segment, then you can form a parallelogram out of them by using those as your acute vertex or the vertex for your acute angles. Well, let's maybe draw a slightly bigger picture just to convince ourselves that this is the case. So let's maybe do the three case or whatever. So we're breaking the line segment at the bottom into three pieces. So let's see, that's gonna look something like this. Okay, so let's pick a vertex at random. So let's pick maybe this vertex right here. And observe that if we pick that vertex right there, we've got a couple of choices for vertices that are not connected via a line segment. So we've got this vertex right here, that's a good choice. Notice there's no direct line segment from down here to this one. Then we have this one up here, and we have this one over here. Now this one in the middle defines the same sort of parallelogram that we have up here. So we might as well choose this one up here so it's something different and observe that it is defining a parallelogram. It's just a slightly bigger parallelogram. And of course the one that we didn't choose, which is this vertex over here, would have like, maybe defined a companion parallelogram to this one up here. One like up to maybe a bit of a rotation or a reflection of this triangle. Okay, so I think this seems to be kind of an obvious truth that if you have pairs of points, 
that are not connected via a line segment, then those uniquely define a parallelogram via using those as the acute angles. Okay, so now that we've got that kind of taken care of, let's see how we can do this counting problem. Okay, so at this point we've argued that the number of parallelograms in our picture over here is equal to the number of points not connected via a line segment. Now, counting this directly would be kind of tricky, but maybe counting the complement is a little bit easier. So this is in fact equal to the number of pairs of points. So just take all of the points and then we'll subtract the number of pairs connected by a line segment. So let's get that written. So number of pairs uh, connected by a line segment. Counting up the number of pairs connected by a line segment, well, observe that we can really think of that rotationally. So if we count the number of pairs connected by a line segment in this bottom edge, then that's equivalent to also doing it on this left edge and this right edge. And in fact, any horizontal line is equivalent to maybe counting it on any upward, up and rightward line or down and leftward line. And that's simply by a rotation there. So by symmetry, this number over here is the same thing as three times the number of pairs connected by a line segment on any horizontal line. And that's because, well, we get one from taking the actual horizontal lines, and then two from taking the maybe up and rightward trending lines, and then the third from the down and leftward trending lines. Okay, so now let's see if we can start counting these things. So how many pairs of points are there? Well, observe that that's gonna be the total number of points, choose two. And so how do we do that? Well, we need the total number of points first. Observe that we can count it row wise. So up here, there's a single point. Then we have two points here, three points here, four points here, all the way down n, point one, n plus one points at the bottom. So the numbers of pairs of points is one plus two plus three, all the way up to n plus one, choose two. Because remember this binomial coefficient is choosing or counting the number of two element subsets of a, well, this number of element set, because this is the total number of points. And then from that, we're gonna subtract three times well, the number of pairs connected by any line segment on a horizontal line, and we can do that the same kind of way. So we start up here and we choose how many of our pairs of points we can from one point. So that'll be one choose two, which is of course equal to zero, but for completeness, let's put it in there. And then on the second row, it'll be two choose two. On the third row, it'll be three choose two, all the way down there, on the nth row, or I guess it's the n plus first row, it'll be n plus one, choose two. So we've got that kind of calculation to do. Now, let's observe that this uh, sum, one up to n plus one, that's like a well-known triangular number, and that's in fact equal to n plus one times n plus two over two. So we're gonna use that moving forward. And then this down here, we can write as the sum, as maybe k goes from one up to n plus one of, well, what is it gonna be? Let's see, it'll be k choose two. But now we can use the fact that k choose two is in fact equal to k times k minus one over two, or k squared minus k over two, to simplify the calculation. Okay, so let's start the next board with, you know, what we figured out here. So here's where we ended up on the last board. So we've got our number of parallelograms. This is binomial coefficient n plus one times n plus two over two, choose two. So maybe let's get this out of here and let's rewrite that as um, n squared plus three n plus two all over two choose two, because I think that'll be a little bit easier to work with. 
And then from that, we're gonna subtract three times the sum as k goes from one to n plus one of k squared minus k over two. Okay, so now let's get going. So by the definition of the binomial coefficient, this will be n squared plus three n plus two over two times, well, it's gonna be this quantity minus one. But observe, but observe subtracting one, we'll simply get rid of this two in the numerator. So we have n squared plus three n over two. So, and then all of that is going to be over two. So if you think about this number up here as being like, for instance, m, then the binomial coefficient is m times m minus one over two. And that's what we have, m, m minus one over two. Okay, and then here we can maybe factor the two out of the denominator and we have three halves. And now we can use the formula for the sum of the first n plus one squares. And I'll let you look at that up if you need to, but it's gonna be something like this. n plus one times n plus two times two n plus three all over six. So that's what we get from the k squared term. And then from the k term, we're gonna have what? So it's gonna be n plus one times n plus two all over, let's see, it'll be all over two. So now where can we go from there? Well, I think maybe in order to aid ourselves in simplification, let's go back to this first term and let's write it back as n plus one times n plus two. Because observe that that's gonna be a common factor. We have this in the first term, also in the second and the third term. So I think that's gonna help us uh, being able to simplify it by factoring it out. Okay, so let's in fact, factor out an n plus one times an n plus two over eight. So why over eight? Because we've got two times two times two there, that's gonna be an eight. And then, well, what are we gonna have left over? So in this first term, we'll have an n squared plus a three n left over after the factorization. And then what do we have for this other bit? Well, we need to be a little bit careful. Let's observe that we can distribute this three through. It's gonna cancel this six down to a two, and then it'll give us a three here. And then, well, let's also observe when we factor the eight out, we're gonna have all of this connected to a multiplication of two. That's because we really have a four in the denominator for each of those. So here we're gonna have minus two times two n plus three. And then that'll be two n plus three, let's see, minus three. Okay, and we get that minus three because, well, let's see, it's this minus three right here. But now what do we get when we simplify? So let's observe that the three and the three will cancel and we'll have n squared plus three n minus four n, so we have n squared minus, but now we can factor that out and we'll have in the end, n plus two times n plus one from these first two times an n times an n minus one from that term right there, all over eight. But I'm gonna write that as four times two times one with like something missing there. Because observe that if we put a three there, we have a three factorial. And we can put a three there if we multiply a three in the numerator. But now observe that we have a binomial coefficient left over. In fact, now this is three times the binomial coefficient n plus two, choose four. And I think that's a really nice form for the solution here. And that's a good place to stop.